I want to welcome you this morning to the online church. And uh, hey, we give a shout out to Dustina and Nathan and Michael and uh, uh, Destiny and Nikki and all your family up there in Tennessee. Hey, Dustina. Good morning, Pastor. Good morning, church. How are y'all today? Praise God. We're doing fine, doing fine, doing fine. How about you all? Oh, we're doing wonderful. The rain has passed. The sun is out and shining. It's a little windy today, but all is beautiful. Everything's blooming great. Praise God. And the allergies are leaving you alone, huh? Yes, sir. I'm so glad. Hallelujah. It took a while. Hallelujah. Well, it's good to hear from you. We'll be hearing from you later on, okay? All right. God bless you. Praise God. Hey, folks, it's raining here in Lithonia, Georgia. Got a pretty heavy rain going on. And uh, I bless God. Thank God for the rain. Just like uh, Dustina's testimony, I can hear again. Hallelujah. I can hear again. Thank you for your prayers. It's been three weeks of uh, trying to hear, struggling to hear. But I can hear again. God has restored my hearing. And I thank God. You know, the pollen shut down my hearing. But greater is he in me than he that's in the world. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your prayers, everybody. Let's give a shout-out to Jackie Fisher up in Kentucky. Hey, Jackie. Hey, Pastor Carter and Church. Uh, God bless everybody today. We have a beautiful sunny day. Praise and God. Rain, Praise God. So the, and the rain ended. Uh, blew my door open last night right in the middle of the night. Oh, okay, the rain blew her door open, everybody. Praise God. Well, praise God. The anointing blew her door open. Hallelujah. Well, bless you and Russell and the family, Jackie. God bless you. Thank you. You as well. All right, all right. Terry Jeep Girl in Colorado, way up in Loveland, Colorado. Come on and say hello to us, would you please? Good morning, Pastor. Good morning, Church. Morning. We have a cloudy day here. We just had about nine inches of snow, but most of it's melted. So, yay, I'm glad. We're starting Hallelujah. to see green grass. Nine inches of snow. Praise God. Yeah. We won't complain. Hey, Terry, we will not complain. No. We, we needed the moisture, so we're thankful for it. Good, good. And so glad to hear your voice. Hallelujah. Praise God. We'll talk to you a little bit later on. There are several others on. Let's give a shout out to uh, Ryan Trogler up in uh, Marysville, Pennsylvania. Hey, Ryan. Oh, good morning, Pastor. Good morning, Church. How are you doing today, Pastor? Blessed and highly favored. <laughs> Amen to that. Amen to that. Hallelujah. Yeah, it's, it's a cloudy day up here. We're supposed to get some rain later on today. Okay, okay. Well, praise God. Praise God. Thank God for the rain. I thank God for the sunshine. Thank God for the snow in Colorado. Thank God. We can see the hand of God moving, moving mightily, and we give him the glory and the honor. Okay, we're going to ask you, Ryan, since while you're online, if you would lead the church in prayer this morning. Okay. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for making another beautiful day. Uh, we also want to thank you for dying on the cross and shedding your blood for all of our sins. Uh, we want you to uh, touch Pastor Carter, give him the wisdom and the knowledge to share your word today. Uh, we want to bless this online ministry today, <clears throat> Excuse me, as we do every week. And we just want to thank you for just everything that you do in our lives, for you know, providing all of our needs and you know, just, just for being and walking with us every day of our lives. And we just want to thank you and glorify you and praise you in Jesus Christ's precious name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Ryan. We just praise God. We just praise God. I'm so glad that we're not stuck on titles here at the online church because if we were in the Baptist church, we'd be calling Ryan Deacon Ryan. Deacon Ryan's going to lead us to the throne of grace. Or if we were in the Pentecostal church, Minister Ryan's going to lead us in prayer. Or uh, different denominations will give you different labels. But Ryan is our brother, hallelujah, and he's faithful. And he prays for us. And God hears his prayers. And so um, we just thank God. Let's go down into Texas and, and let's give a shout-out to Zisla and ask her to come on and say hello to us. 
Hi, good morning, Pastor Carter. Good Thank morning. you so much for a, a beautiful day as well here in Texas. And, yeah, we know that this week will be a holy week. And uh, let everyone praise, you know, give praise to glory, you know, to our God, you know, Father God, and also for Lord Jesus Christ, you know, through, through, the, through this pretty and week that we're going to have. Amen. 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 Thank you, Zisla. And God bless you and your family. And uh, we just thank God that you're witnessing in Texas and God is using you. We give him the praise. Well, everybody, today is Palm Sunday, and um, we're going to look at our message today. God's got a mighty message for us, and, and it's going to be entitled, From Palm Sunday to the Resurrection, What Happened? From Palm Sunday to the Resurrection, What Happened? We're going to look at the events of uh, what we call Holy Week and um, culminate this message with the resurrection, talk more about the resurrection next week. What happened when Jesus raised from, was raised from the dead? What happened when Jesus got up from the dead? And so we're lo looking for two very powerful uh, messages in the next couple of weeks. And I want to thank you all for being a part of this church. We are a church family, and I know God is moving mightily in your lives, and I pray that he will continue to do so. God is raising up a mighty church. And the online church, which is part of the real church, we are reaching out in areas where uh, others have not been able to go. I would not be surprised if God has many of you reaching out to others by way of the internet and by way of technology to share the word of God. You see, God loves the world so much. He does not want anyone to perish. And he wants us to use every available voice, every available voice. Well, right now, the, the most available voice that um, God has me using is the Internet, rather than being a pastor in a brick-and-mortar church. So we work with the brick-and-mortar pastors and the body of Christ. And many of you are members of the brick-and-mortar church. Uh, Jackie attends her church every Sunday, and she's a hard worker there, and and, and showing people the way to the Lord. They're watching her grow, and, uh, and, and she's come a long way, and God is using her mightily, and I'm, I'm so glad. And so when we in the body of Christ get the vision of God, when we get the whole vision of God, Ryan, that uh, God wants this gospel to go forth into all the world, and, and Jesus knows that the there are limitations on the brick and mortar church. Uh, when people are, many people are located in a specific building or location, and that kind of puts limitations on them. And uh, Jesus knows how people put people others in a denominational box, and and many are not even permitted by people in people's mindsets to branch out further than their building on the corner. And so God has raised up the online church, and so many people today are into technology and, and uh, cell phones and the computer and computer technology. But the, So the Lord is using this technology to get people's attention. And so we're, we're reaching out. We're going forth into uh, the Internet, um, YouTube, Facebook, uh, looking into going into uh, putting photos on Instagram and others just to get people's attention that God loves you people. He loves you, whoever you are, wherever you are, and he wants you to be saved. Praise God. And so um, a part of my message today is, is a conclusion that there is no excuse. There is no excuse for anybody not being saved today. There is no excuse, especially if you live in America and if you have heard the word of God and you have access to the word of God. And so we're, we're appealing to those of you who are listening to this recording. We're appealing to those of you who are online. And um, as you continue to grow, seek the Lord with all your heart. We want you to know that God loves you. God wants you to know that. And don't quit. Don't quit. Many people are in bondage. Some are caught up in sexual sins. Some have marital problems. Some are 
inundated by sickness and overwhelmed by sickness and disease. Some have financial problems. There are many households where people are caught up on drugs and opioids. But don't quit. Don't give up. Don't give up on your loved ones, ladies and gentlemen. Don't give up on your neighbors. Don't give up on the church. And don't give up on this government. Ladies and gentlemen, God is going to give us good government. God is going to give us honest government. God does not support lies. God is not a man that he should lie. And so we're looking for a change. A change is going to come. A change is going to come in the nation. And a change is going to come in your nation wherever you're tuned in to this service. And we thank God. We thank God for David Carter in Dubai. We thank God for our friends in Africa. We thank God for our friends in Jamaica. We thank God for our friends in Switzerland, all over the world. We thank God for those who view this ministry by way of the archives in from our YouTube channel. And I thank God for the, our, our, our ground troopers, our, our ground troopers. I thank God for Dustina and Nathan and Nikki and and Destiny and Michael. I thank God for Jackie Fisher and Russell. Thank God for Terry Jeep Girl. Thank God for Ryan. Thank God for my son Wes. <clears throat> thank God for Zizla, Roger Pond, so many of us who, who are ground troopers. I mean, you're walking with us every week, every Sunday. David Carter, we thank God. And God is blessing you all. And I pray that God will bless you supernaturally, abundantly above all that you can ask or think. And so let's take a look at the scripture. And then we're going to look at our message for today from Palm Sunday to the resurrection. And we're going to look at what happened. Turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew 21. Or download Matthew 21. And we're going to look at the first 11 verses of Matthew 21. Matthew 21. Does anyone want to read this scripture for us this morning? A good, strong reader? Please, Jackie Fisher, I saw you touch your uh, touch something and light went on. So, Jackie, would you read the scripture for us? Matthew 21, 1 through 11. Pardon me, I have a little bit of toast in my mouth. <laughs> a little bit of toast in your mouth. Well, we're going to wait for her to clear that toast, ladies and gentlemen, and Jackie Fisher is going to read the scriptures for us. The triumphal entry, and when they drew nigh unto Jerusalem, and were come to Bethpage unto the Mount of Olives, then sent Jesus two disciples, saying unto them, Go into the village over against you, and straightway ye shall find an ass tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them unto me. And if any man say aught unto you, Ye shall say, The Lord hath need of them, and straightway he will send them. All this was done, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell ye the daughter of Zion, Behold, thy king cometh unto thee, meek and sitting upon an ass, and a colt the foal of an ass. And the disciples went, and did as Jesus commanded them, and brought the ass and the colt, and put on them their clothes, and they set him thereon. And a very great multitude spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from the trees, and strawed them in the way. And the multitudes that went before, and that followed, cried, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he was come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? And the multitude said, 
This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee, cleansing of the temple. And Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves. One more verse, please. Okay. And said unto them, It is written, My house shall be called the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. Hallelujah. Jackie Fisher, thank you very much for the wonderful reading of the Word of God. Praise God. And she wasn't even nervous, ladies and gentlemen. She was not even nervous. Hallelujah. Praise God. We thank you, Father, for using Jackie to read the Word. And so let's take a look, ladies and gentlemen, at what happened during Palm Sunday and Resurrection and the week that led up to the resurrection. Let's review the events and come to some conclusions as the Lord gives us uh, his message today. On the Sunday before his death, Jesus began his trip to Jerusalem, <clears throat> knowing that soon he would lay down his life for our sins. Nearing the village of Bethphage, he sent two of his disciples ahead, telling them to look for a donkey and its unbroken coat. The disciples were instructed to untie the animals and bring them to him. So Jesus sent his disciples ahead, go and find, you're going to find in this city a, a donkey and, and her colt. And the colt has never been ridden before, so bring them to me. If anybody asks you, hey, what are you doing with my animals? You tell them, the Lord has need of them. And so, hey, uh, David Carter, welcome. We're in Matthew 21, verses 1 through 13. <clears throat> then Jesus sat on the donkey and slowly, humbly made his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, fulfilling the prophecy of Zechariah 9.9. Now, Zechariah did not say, that Jesus would ride in a Lamborghini. He did not say it would be a Mercedes Benz. He did not say it would be a, a Cadillac. Uh, Jesus was, it was prophesied by the prophet Zechariah in the ninth chapter, in the ninth verse, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So Zechariah prophesied that the Messiah, the King of Kings, would ride into Jerusalem on a donkey. And Jesus fulfilled that scripture. As we look at the cross, as we look at Palm Sunday, the week, the events of that week that followed Palm Sunday and the crucifixion as, and the resurrection, you will see so many Old Testament prophecies fulfilled. And Jesus did say, I have come to, I've not come to destroy the, the word or, or the, the word of God. I've come to fulfill, fulfill the scriptures. And we see him doing this in everything he does. He is fulfilling scriptural prophecy. And so we see him fulfilling Zechariah's prophecy, how he would ride into town. No, he did not fly in on Air Force One. He did not fly in on a, a, a Boeing helicopter, a 747. No, he did not come in a caravan of Cadillac limousines. No, he came on a lowly donkey, a, 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 an, a, an animal that, that had never been ridden before. Isn't it amazing that that animal did not buck or try to throw him? Uh, he had never had a rider before, but Jesus rode into town on a donkey a humble entry for a king. Uh, and in those days, in those days, conquering kings would ride into a city on a white horse. It was traditional that a conquering general would ride into a city on a white horse. And all the people would come and they'd throw their clothes before the conquering king saying, we submit to you, we submit our will to your will. But Jesus did not come riding on a white horse. He came riding on a lowly beast of burden, a, a donkey that had not had a man sit on him before. The crowds welcomed him, 
by waving palm branches in the air and shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. There was The, the crowd was not like the crowd today where you see uh, cell phones, people waving their cell phones, trying to take a picture, uh, or people holding placards, uh, uh, and, 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 and people with baseball caps on with uh, certain letters on them. Uh, make Jerusalem great again. No, Jesus did not come that way, ladies and gentlemen. He came humbly, and, and he came with a purpose. He knew that his purpose for going into Jerusalem was to die. Ladies and gentlemen, put yourself in Jesus' position. Imagine you are Jesus, and you're going into the city where uh, that you love, where, where it's corrupt with crime and sin, and even though a great crowd is going to greet you and honor you and, and, and hail you, Jesus knows that that same crowd is going to uh, put him to death five days later. Can you imagine how he must have felt knowing that the end of his three-year ministry had come, had come, that he had come to the end of his 33 years on earth, and Jesus had not counted it robbery to leave heaven and to go to earth, he did not count it robbery to leave all the glory in heaven and the presence of his Father to live on earth as a man for 33 years <clears throat> and to be tried and tempted just as we are, yet without sin. Every day of Jesus' 33 years on this earth, every day he was tempted. Uh, 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 his, his life was threatened when he was a baby. As he grew up, we know very little about that. But he was tempted, the scripture says, just like you and I are, and yet he was without sin. He was, uh, Satan put the same thoughts in his mind that Satan puts in our minds, yet Jesus did not sin. He knew his purpose, and his, he knew his mission, and he was tempted. I mean, he was tempted with riches. He was tempted with fame. He was tempted with kingdoms. He was tempted with women. He was tempted with everything that the devil could throw in his face. And the devil even told him, if you bow down and worship me, I'll give you all these kingdoms. Yet Jesus knew what his purpose was, and he honored the Father, gave glory and honor to the Father. And he did this, ladies and gentlemen, because he loves you and me. I'm going to say that again. He did this all because he loves you you and me. So number one, day one, we see his triumphal entry into uh, Jerusalem. That night, he spent the night with um, Mary and Martha and their brother Lazarus. Jesus had just previously, the previous Sunday, raised Lazarus from the dead. And everybody in Jerusalem heard about the glory and honor of Jesus who raised Lazarus from the dead. And so here he is, coming into their city, and they uh, take palm leaves. They wave palm leaves from the palm tree. They take uh, portions of their clothing, their shirts, and their coats, and they throw them in front of that donkey so that this conquering hero uh, could, could come and rule over them. And what they were saying, uh, listen to this, they were saying, Hosanna to the highest. In other words, save us, Lord. In other words, they're saying, only you can save us, Lord. This is what the crowd was saying. Only you can save us, Lord. But ladies and gentlemen, that same crowd, that same crowd, five days later, that same crowd, when Pilate said, what shall I do then with Jesus? The same crowd said, crucify him, crucify him. Ladies and gentlemen, don't get caught up with the many likes you have on Facebook how many people like your Facebook uh, page. Don't get caught up on the number of people sending you text messages or emails. Don't get uh, uh, caught up by the people who charm you with their uh, emails and their messages or their phone calls. Ladies and gentlemen, the crowd is fickle. The crowd is fickle. A person may love you today and hate you tomorrow. I know I can get a witness out there. A person will swear, swear that they love you today and hate your guts tomorrow. Uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, and we, we saw this when, when um, 
President Bush left the White House. I mean, the same crowd that uh, cheered him coming into the White House uh, when he left. I mean, they just humiliated the man. Ladies and gentlemen, don't don't let the crowd uh, fool you. Don't get caught up in the crowd. Don't get caught up in the church meeting. Don't get caught up in the caught up in the so-called democratic process in the church. Or don't get caught up in which way the deacons want to vote on the matter, or which way the pastor wants to vote on a matter, or which way the, the leaders of the church want to vote on a matter. Ladies and gentlemen, we find throughout Scripture that the crowd can be wrong. We found this in Joshua, when Joshua and Caleb came before the congregation and said, we can take this land. We can take this land. It's only 11 days journey from us. We can take these, this land. But the crowd, the majority of you said, oh, no, no, no. Let's go back to Egypt. Let's become slaves to Egypt again. We're like grasshoppers in these people's sight. Uh, uh, we're like grasshoppers. There are giants in the land. We can't conquer this land. Ladies and gentlemen, the crowd can destroy you. The crowd can destroy you. I'm so glad that we have a, a course in the Paul Bagley School of Prophecy called Communion with God. And ladies and gentlemen, if you have not taken that course, you need to take it. You need to contact me to enroll in that course to learn how to hear from God for yourself. Don't get caught up in what the majority of the people think or what do you think about this or what do you think about that. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to start a new Bible study on Wednesday nights starting in September. It'll be a free Bible study. We want to reach out to the body of Christ who's not being taught the Word of God, and we're going to present Bible study. We're going to go through the Bible with the people and give them a real solid Bible study. And we're not going to do like uh, they do in some Bible studies in some churches where somebody may read a scripture and then uh, the teacher may go around the circle, well, what do you think about this? Or what do you think about this? Or what do you think? Because it is not what people think about the scripture, ladies and gentlemen. The Bible says there is only one interpretation of the scripture. I want to know what does Jesus think? What does Jesus think? What's his take on this? And so here's Jesus coming triumphantly into Jerusalem. That happened on day one. Uh, that night of day one, he spent uh, time, he spent the night, he and his disciples with their friends Mary and Martha and Lazarus in a place called Bethany, just a few miles outside of Jerusalem. And uh, Lazarus had just been raised from the dead, ladies and gentlemen, just a week ago. Lazarus, Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. Read John chapter 10 about that exciting experience where Lazarus had been dead and Jesus uh, waited four days before going to the grave and Jesus spoke to the dead and said, Lazarus, come forth. Lazarus, come forth. And the dead man got up from the grave and walked up out of the grave. And he was in that crowd. He was in with Jesus and this is his disciples when Jesus rode triumphantly into Jerusalem. Now that was day one. Now day two, we find Jesus clearing the temple. So our subject today, David Carter and all my friends in Dubai, is uh, from the Palm Sunday to the resurrection, what happened? We're going to review the events of what happened, then come to some conclusions. The next day, day two, Jesus returned with his disciples to Jerusalem. Along the way, he cursed a fig tree because it had failed to bear fruit. Jesus was hungry. His disciples were hungry. They decided, hey, hey, look here. The fig tree is blooming. Let's eat some figs. And so they went to the fig tree, and the fig tree was full of blossoms and wasn't bringing forth any fruit. And ladies and gentlemen, you can look at the church. A whole lot of people have blossoms on them. Oh, hey, Justina, a whole lot of trees got blossoms on them. Don't get, uh, don't get fooled by the male cherry tree. You can go into Washington, D.C., and you can look at all those blossoms on those male cherry trees. You know, trees come in male and female. And, and the male cherry trees have the prettiest blossoms. But if you're waiting to eat some cherries from that tree, you'll, wait, you'll be waiting until uh, 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 hell freezes over, ladies and gentlemen. And hell ain't going to freeze over. But you'll be waiting for a long time 
for what those male cherry trees to bring forth fruit, they ain't going to bring forth any fruit. They will blossom. They look pretty. And speaking of that, uh, a lot of people don't go to church today because there are too many blossoms, too many pretty trees sitting up. I mean, it's a, it's a fashion show. And, and, and some people are, don't want to be caught up in the fashion show. Me, I don't want to be sitting in the pulpit with a whole bunch of pimps. And and, 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 and and guys looking good and, 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 and flaunting their good looks and their clothing and their shoes. And, and I, got, I got sick and tired of that when I was in the main line church. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, uh, one day I, I decided to wear my sneakers to church just to let everybody know I ain't caught up in this manner. So I, I put on an old pair. They were not Nikes. They were not Michael Jordans. They were Bobos. You know, uh, twelve ninety eight for the from the from the from the uh, local local uh, uh, family dollar store. I put them on, and you know, people look down on me for wearing them in church. People are caught up in in the wrong things, ladies and gentlemen. And so uh, Jesus uh, ran into that when he looked at the fig tree. He cursed that fig tree. He said, "No man shall eat fruit from you from here on. No man will eat fruit." From you, and some people say, well, the cursing of the fig tree represents God's judgment on the spiritually dead religious leaders. In other words, we've got a whole lot of, I mean, ladies and gentlemen, I know that bishops and prelates and 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 uh, cardinals and and I know some of these guys. They, I mean, I, they wear these big old hats and and carry these big old, I call them canes, but they're actually staffs, walking sticks that are curled, you know, like a uh, shepherd's staff, and, and they have these big, all these robes and jewels and all this, and, and they got to drive big, fine cars and uh, live in fine houses, and, 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 and some of them, I mean, some, they're millionaires, uh, and, and, uh, and, and, and um, we got one getting ready to leave Atlanta in, in, a, in a few weeks to go to become the cardinal of Washington, D.C., so he's going to live in a billion-dollar house, and and, 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 and live that pompous life. But ladies and gentlemen, all these flowering fig trees are not bringing forth fruit. And so people are tired of this. People are sick and tired of this in the church. And when you look at, when you look at, uh, Dustina, when you look at the statistics, 80% of the American people do not attend church anymore. I mean, the people have gotten sick and tired of what they see in the church. And many don't go because they don't believe. Many don't go because they're backslidden. Many don't go because they're caught up in other things. Many don't go because they've turned their backs on God. Many don't go because they have let other things prioritize themselves uh, rather than God. And so we need to get the gospel out. Not only get the gospel out, not only preach the word, but be doers of the word also. David, I know in Dubai you're a doer of the word not just a preacher of the gospel. We might be, ladies and gentlemen, the only Jesus this world can see. Now, you know, if 80% of Americans do not attend church, what is it like in other nations? And so uh, Jesus cursed the fig tree and said, you will never bring forth fruit in your lifetime. Then others believe that when Jesus cursed that uh, fig tree, he was... Uh, actually speaking to all believers who, who look good and know what to say and know the right things to say and know how to play church and know how to go through the motions but have no real fruit in their lives. And so, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we've got to seek the Lord. On. Lord, what did you intend when you cursed the fig tree? And so, uh, the disciples eventually ask him that the next day. And you'll read that as you continue reading uh, Matthew 21. When Jesus arrived at the temple on Monday, he found the courts full of corrupt money changers. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus arrived at the temple, that great building that was dedicated to God, that building this particular temple was built by Herod around 57 A.D. And uh, this, this is the building that was built on top of the building that was destroyed uh, after Nehemiah built the walls to the temple and Haggai and, and others uh, rededicated that particular temple. Uh, this was about the third temple. 
I hear a lot of prophets talking about the third temple. There were three temples already. The, the, the next temple will be the fourth temple. The first temple was the temple built by uh, Solomon. The next was the built, one built by uh, Haggai. Zerubbabel and Haggai, the third temple, was the one built by Herod. And so a lot of prophets and preachers are saying, oh, Israel's looking for the third temple. No, they're not. The third temple's been destroyed. It was destroyed in 70 A.D. <clears throat> now they're looking for the fourth temple, the fourth temple to be built. And so Jesus was terribly upset. I mean, this is God walking into his house the house that people built to dedicate to him. And instead of seeing people worshiping, instead of seeing the priests making sacrifices on behalf of the people, instead of people seeing people in sackcloth and ashes bringing uh, their offering unto the Lord, instead of seeing uh, 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 repentance and crying out for deliverance, Jesus has to walk among in the temple courtyard money changers, changing currencies, uh, into the euro, into the U.S. dollar, into uh, the various uh, 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 denominations of money for the various languages that came into the temple. Different people from different parts of the world came to the temple, and they had to exchange their monies into the Jewish money. And the money changes. They were greedy. They, changed, they charged exorbitant uh, interest rates and, 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 and transition rates. Not only that, but they were selling stuff, selling turtle dolls and pigeons and, and, and goats and, 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 and sheep and, and cattle and oxen to be, to be slaughtered for sacrifice. So people came and purchased inside the temple their offering unto God and then gave it to the priest. Not only that, but the priests were corrupt. They kept the best portions of the sacrificial meat for themselves. And their family sold that meat to other people for money. Ladies and gentlemen, the temple was corrupt. Not only that, ladies and gentlemen, but on the top of the temple, many kings had built groves and, and altars to unknown gods. Solomon even built on the top of his temple groves for his wives to worship Baal and worship uh, uh, ungodly uh, uh, heathenist, heathenistic gods. And so... The temple was corrupt, and Jesus walked into the temple, and I know it made him want to puke. And, and the Bible says he took a whip, he platted a whip, and he drove them out. Uh, verse 12 of chapter 21, and Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple. He overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves and said unto them, It is written, My house shall be called the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. One of the gospel writers said, Jesus took leather and platted a whip and started whipping up all folks. He started beating those money changers, beating those religious leaders, chasing them, chasing the corruption out of his house. Some people think Christians ought to be punks and wimps. Well, Jesus was not a punk or a wimp. Jesus was aggressive. He took authority. He got to the place where he whipped up on people and turned over the money changers, the tables, and said, you have made my father's house a den of thieves. This should be a house of prayer. And ladies and gentlemen, there are a lot of churches that are doing the same thing that they did in the temple. There are churches, if you walk in those churches today, right now, 1146 a.m., on a Sunday morning, you're going to smell chicken frying in the, on the stove. You're going to smell collard greens cooking. You're going to smell baked goods. You're going to see tables lined up, ladies and gentlemen, or in the hallways of the church. You're going to hear the ladies laughing and giggling and making noise in the kitchen, ladies, as they prepare those meals. And, and, and then they're going to sell those dinners after church. They're not going to give them away. They're not going to take them downtown to feed the hungry. They're going to sell them. And ladies and gentlemen, I'll tell you, it's hard to sit up in church smelling food cooking. It's hard to sit up in church hearing the people in the kitchen making noise. It is hard to focus when you, when you smell food cooking. It is hard to even get to a place of comfort in the church where you have to walk through the bookstore. you got to come through the bookstore 
to get into uh, the church. You've got to see what the latest device is that they're selling. And everybody's selling stuff. So you've got hustlers. You've got vendors inside the church, ladies and gentlemen. Hustlers and vendors. And, and that's why a lot of people don't want to go to church today, ladies and gentlemen. Jesus said, you have made my father's house a den of thieves. So on Tuesday, day three, Tuesday, Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. On Tuesday morning, Jesus and his disciples returned to Jerusalem. They passed the withered fig tree on their way, and Jesus spoke to his companions about the importance of faith. Back at the temple, the religious leaders were upset at Jesus for establishing himself as a spiritual authority. They were also upset that he turned the temple out uh, the day before. And so they organized an ambush with the intent to place him under arrest. But Jesus escaped their traps and pronounced harsh judgment on them, saying, and here's what he said to those religious, religious leaders, blind guides, for you are like whitewashed tombs, beautiful on the outside but filled on the inside with dead people's bones and all sorts of impurity. Outwardly you look like, you look like righteous people, but inwardly your hearts are filled with hypocrisy and lawlessness. Snakes, sons of vipers, how will you escape the judgment of hell? That's found in Matthew 23 verses 24 to 33. That's Matthew 23, verses 24 to 33. How will you escape the judgment of hell? And ladies and gentlemen, there are a lot of religious leaders who are not going to escape the judgment of hell. You've got them all over TV, all over the Internet. They're begging for your money. They're doing this. They're promising this. And, and they have no intent whatsoever to lead you to the Lord or represent the Lord Jesus Christ. They are busy building their kingdom. Ladies and gentlemen, it grieved my heart just last week to see one of them on, uh, on the news last week wearing a pair of $4,000 sneakers, ladies and gentlemen, a pair of $4,000 sneakers. Ladies and gentlemen, I told you about the $12.99 sneakers I wore one time when I went to church, but this man had a pair of $4,000 sneakers especially designed for him. And the sad thing is, People are giving money so that a guy like him can wear a pair of $4,000 sneakers. This same man just bought his wife a brand-new Lamborghini and uh, spent $250,000 for a brand-new Lamborghini. And then he had the nerve to go to the church last week and say, well, the church needs a new roof. We need to raise $250,000. Well, if he'd sell his sneakers, he could put two roofs on the church. If he'd sell that Lamborghini, he can get the roof on the church. Ladies and gentlemen, it's sad to see that kind of deception. And, and, and here we are on the online church, and we don't even ask for money. We have one fundraiser. We're just asking people to donate so we can help the people in Africa who worship under the trees to build a church. But then uh, uh, there are people who don't even want to give to that. Ladies and gentlemen, we have been deceived. This religious system has deceived a lot of people, but don't let yourself be deceived. Don't let yourself be deceived. Praise God. And so Jesus told the uh, Pharisees, the scribes, the Sadducees, and uh, even uh, spoke to the high priest and the priest, you are a bunch of whitewashed sepulchers, whitewashed graves. Your graves look good on the, on the outside, but you're full of dead men's bones. You have no life in them. And ladies and gentlemen, sitting up in our churches right now, right now, and, and sitting up in people's houses are 80% who don't go to church right now. Uh, they look holy. They want to present themselves holy between the hour of 11 and 12 on a Sunday morning or 12 and 1. For, for, for one hour, they want to look righteous and holy, but are full of dead men's bones. Jesus said, you must be born again. He told Nicodemus, you must be born again. So Jesus, that evening, went to the Mount of Olives, and there he prayed. He taught, and then he prayed uh, on the Mount of Olives. And then the next day, day four, is called Holy Wednesday, but we don't know much about what happened on that Holy Wednesday. Some, some 
uh, biblical scholars say, well, Jesus was tired and his disciples tired and they rested. Ladies and gentlemen, I, I don't know about that. I don't know about that. I don't know. But we don't have much information on that. Okay. And uh, day five was the Passover or Thursday. And the church calls it Maundy Thursday. I never heard of Maundy Thursday until I went to seminary. I had no clue what a Maundy was. But it's, it, it, it means the, the, the night that Jesus broke bread with his disciples and what we celebrate as the Last Supper. Okay, so from Bethany, Jesus sent Peter and John ahead to the upper room in Jerusalem to make preparations for the Passover feast. That evening after sunset, Jesus washed the feet of his disciples as they prepared to share in the Passover by performing this humble act of service, Jesus demonstrated by example how believers should love one another. Hey, when's the last time you've been involved in a foot washing? When's the last time you washed somebody's feet? When's the last time you washed somebody's, somebody else's stinking feet? Uh, uh, the church used to do that. We used to have foot washing services in the brick and mortar church. And uh, it's a humble experience. It's a humble experience to wash somebody's feet. Somebody, they got fungus on their feet. They got rot gut on their feet. Their feet stink. Their socks stink. Their shoes stink. But you're going to humble yourself and wash their feet. This is what Jesus did. Jesus said, if anyone will be uh, 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 recognized among you, they must become your servant. And we in the church are servants one to another. And so they had the Passover, the foot washing, and the Last Supper on Monday, Thursday, it was on Monday, Thursday that uh, Judas went out and, and finalized his contract with the high priest, picked up his 30 pieces of silver, and the next night, uh, and, and later, later on that night, he's going to come back and kiss Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane, and the soldiers are going to arrest Jesus. Okay? All righty. Meantime, in the early morning hours, starting early Friday morning, Jesus was on trial. Day six, day six, that's day six. The trial, the crucifixion, the death and burial. Good Friday is the most difficult day of Passion Week. Christ's journey turned treacherous and acutely painful in those final hours leading to his death. According to the scripture, Judas Iscariot was overcome with remorse and hanged himself early Friday morning. We don't know if he repented or not. We don't know, but he hanged himself. And that uh, uh, people have asked, can a person who commits suicide uh, go to heaven? That's a tough question. I'm not going to answer that right now. Meanwhile, before the third hour, like 9 o'clock a.m., Jesus endured the shame of false accusations, condemnation, mockery, beatings, and abandonment after multiple unlawful trials where he was dragged to the high priest's house and the high priest's father-in-law and then this place and that place. He was dragged all over the place, beaten, bloody, scarred, yet dragging, being dragged from trial to trial. He was sentenced to death by crucifixion, one of the most horrible and disgraceful methods of capital punishment known at that time. Crucifixion was ugly, ladies and gentlemen. Before Christ was led away to be crucified, soldiers spit on him, tormented and mocked him, pierced him with a crown of thorns. Then Jesus was forced to carry his own cross to Calvary, where again he was mocked and insulted as the Roman soldiers nailed him to the cross. But on the way up to Golgotha's hill, Jesus' energy was spent, and he couldn't carry his cross any further. And that's when we see Simon of Cyrene, a man from Africa, being forced by the Roman soldiers to carry Jesus' cross. And so Friday, terrible day, trial, crucifixion, death, burial. They beat him all night long, drug him from place to place all night long, spat on him, urinated on him, defecated on him, uh, humiliated him. And then... Uh, drug him to a cross where they put him to death. By 6 p.m. on Friday evening, Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea took Jesus' body down from the cross and lay it in a tomb. You'll say, 
You may, say, you may be one of those Christians who say, I don't want to deal anything with politics. I wouldn't even want to be caught in Washington, D.C. Well, you know, God needs people in political office. And we see this in the scriptures. Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea were politicians, yet they were secret believers. They were followers of Jesus, and they had favor with Pilate, and they were able to go and ask Pilate for the body of Jesus so that Jesus could be, could be given a decent burial before the end of the day on that Friday. And then day seven, we see Saturday. Saturday, Jesus is dead. He's in the tomb. He's dead. But I will tell you in this, uh, maybe in a message coming soon what happened when Jesus was dead in the tomb. What happened because his spirit went to work. Jesus' spirit. You know, when God breathes into us, we become a living soul. And our spirit can never die. Our spirit can never die. Our spirit will even either go to heaven and rejoice and worship God forever, or our spirit will burn uh, uh, in, 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 a, in a in a a burn in a, a body that cannot be consumed. Our spirit will be con, uh, could be tormented forever and ever in hell. The spirit will never die, ladies and gentlemen. People say, "Well, after I'm dead, it's all over. Ain't nothing left to it." All contrary, your spirit, the life in you, has to go to one of two places. Either you're going to go to heaven, choose heaven, ladies and gentlemen, or you're going to go to hell. In hell, there is torment. People are being tormented every day in hell forever and ever and ever. They feel it. They're in a body that can't be burned up, and they're crying out. Many are crying, Mama, Mama. Many are crying, Jesus, Lord, have mercy. But once you're in hell, there is no release from it, no release. We're going to talk about this in, in a few more weeks, about what happens when a person goes to hell because God gave a, a man a vision of hell. And this man, what he saw, I mean, he saw some big-name preachers. We're not going to call any names, but he saw some big-name people in there, and he saw some things and things in there that, that, that where people think or the church thinks so-and-so is so holy or this is the right thing to do. We're going to take a look at that in a few weeks. And so all day Saturday, Jesus was dead. You may say, well, you know, the Bible says on the third day he arose. Some say after the third day. Some say on the third day. What did Jesus say? You've got to go back to what Jesus says. He said he, said, uh, he will rise on the third day. So we've got to count Friday as day one when he was, he was crucified. Saturday as day two where he laid in the grave dead. And Sunday as day three. That's the best way we can look at it. Otherwise, we're going to get confused because there are some say, well, uh, Easter Sunday was not the day he arose. Actually, he rose on Monday. Some say Tuesday. So we're going to count three days. Count Friday as day one. Count Saturday as day two. And Sunday on uh, the third day. And that's congruent with what Jesus said on the third day. He said, destroy this temple. And the third day he will raise it up. Again, and so uh, we'll talk next week about what happened when Jesus rose from the dead. What happened? Not only did he get up from the dead, but what happened? What happened, ladies and gentlemen? We're going to take a good look at what happened when Jesus got up from the dead. But also, I think we put in there what happened. What happened on Saturday? Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take a look at what happened on Saturday. You'll say, well, he, well, the Bible says he was dead in the grave. Yes, 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 yes. But while he was dead in the grave, while his body was dead in the grave, his spirit, his spirit, his spirit. Well, you tune in next Sunday. You tune in, Jackie Fisher, you tune in next Sunday. Tell everybody, uh, Pastor Carter says, tune in next Sunday so we find out what happened uh, on Saturday. And, and when Jesus' body was in the grave, and then what happened when he rose from the dead. Well, we can draw some conclusions uh, uh, from this message today, which is entitled, From Palm Sunday to the Resurrection, What Happened? We can draw some conclusions. I'll just give you a list of them. Number one, conclude this. Beware of the crowd. Beware of the crowd. Don't get caught up in the crowd. Don't get caught up in the mob. The crowd is fickle. The same crowd that greeted Jesus on Sunday cried out for his resurrection on Friday. On, 
I'm sorry, cried out for his crucifixion on Friday. The crowd will do the same thing to you. Ladies and gentlemen, I guarantee you, the crowd will do the same thing to you. Number two, you need to believe in Jesus for yourself. Don't try to go through this life based on what your mama believed or your daddy believed or Uncle Willie or Cousin Joe or what your best friend believes. No. You need to know Jesus for yourself. And ladies and gentlemen, there is no excuse, no excuse for anyone not knowing Jesus for himself or herself. Jesus said, the thief cometh not but to kill, steal, and destroy. But I am come that you might have life and that you ha might have it more abundantly. Jesus said, seek me with all your heart and you shall find me. There is no excuse for no one, for anyone not knowing Jesus. He said, seek me with your whole heart and you shall find me. Conclusion number three, you must receive Jesus Christ by faith. You must receive him by faith. You can't be born into a certain family and become uh, pronounced a member of the church just because you're a member of the, uh, a certain family or you were born to a certain uh, man or certain woman. No, you must be born again in order to be a part of the church. Why is it so many people have so much trouble understanding this? Why is it that there are people still believing that if I join the church, if I go to church, everything's going to be all right? No, a whole lot of sinners go to church and things are not right. You must be born again. We're going to take a look uh, in a short while uh, what Romans chapter 6 says about the new birth and about sin and, and, and leaving the body of sin and walking in, in righteousness and holiness as a new creation. Conclusion number four. After you receive Jesus, walk in newness of life. I just mentioned that. We'll take a look uh, more <clears throat> in an in, in upcoming lesson about walking in newness of life based on Romans 6, 4. That as Christ was risen from the dead, even so ought you to walk in newness of life. Christ rose up from the dead, so we should walk in newness of life. In other words, we've got to die. You and I have to die in order to be born again. And people have a tough time accepting that. People, there are people, I'm not going to die. I like this world. I like this. You, must be, you must be born again if you're going to go to heaven. Conclusion number five, we've been crucified with Christ. Galatians 2.20. Now, it's kind of hard to understand, but let the Holy Ghost teach you that uh, the Scripture says uh, and. Galatians 2.20, for I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So uh, the scriptures teaches us, teach us that when we receive Jesus as our Savior, we are retroactively nailed on the cross with Jesus, and we die with him, and we go into the grave with him. Romans chapter 6 supports this. We actually go into the grave with him, and when Jesus rose up from the dead, we are in Christ. We in Christ rise up from the dead with him. That's what it means to be born again. Uh, we're going to take a look next week uh, what happened uh, uh, with the resurrection. And then... Uh, my final conclusion I want to share with you today is there should be no excuse for anyone not being saved. Some people will say, well, Pastor Carl, are you judging people? No, I'm not. I'm preaching. You need to discern between a preacher and a judge. You judge the word. You judge the word that I'm saying. You listen to the word I'm preaching. It's the word of God. You must be born again. And Well, where does it say in the Bible that uh, there should be no excuse for anyone uh, not being saved. Well, you don't really, but, hey, brother, hey, sister, you don't really need the Bible to teach you that. You've got common sense. You've lived this life long enough. You know, you've heard enough gospel to know that if you don't receive Jesus, you're going to perish and go to hell. Some people just want to argue. I ain't going to argue with you, but I will tell you this, Romans 2, verse 1, Romans 2, verse 1, if you want a scripture, it says, Thou art inexcusable, O man. Thou art inexcusable. 
There is no there should be no excuse anyone not getting saved. Romans two one says, Thou art inexcusable, O man. And so we've shared with you, hallelujah, with the love of Jesus under the anoint the anointing of the Holy Spirit, uh, what happened between Palm Sunday and Resurrection Sunday. I want you to join me next Sunday morning at eleven o'clock AM when we look at what happened on Saturday. When Jesus' body laid in the grave, what actually took place? And then what happened on Sunday when he rose again from the dead? I mean, we're going to take a look at that. We're going to look at what happened when Jesus rose from the dead. Well, praise God. We bless God. We thank you, Father. We bless God. We praise God. We ask you right now, right where you are, just stop right now. Just lift up your hands. Lift up your hands right now. Jackie Fisher, take the toast out of your mouth. Uh, no chewing on toast. Lift up your hands right now, everybody. Lift up your hands and just say, thank you, Jesus. Say hallelujah in your own way. Just worship him. Extend your hands to God and worship him and thank him. In Dubai, worship him, David Carter. Uh, in Africa, Elijah, worship him. In Jamaica, Bishop uh, uh, Davis, worship him. All of our friends in Switzerland, Annika, worship him. All of our people listening by YouTube and uh by a recording, just take time out right now and honor God and thank God and say thank you, Jesus, for the gift of salvation. And then we want to make this opportunity to any of, the, any of you who are listening today and you say, wow, I need to be saved. I want to be saved. The Bible says you must be born again, that if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. That's a promise that God makes to you, and he guarantees it, and he backs it up with all of heaven. So for those of you who want to be saved, and you need to be saved, don't leave this life in an unsaved condition. Let's make this confession. And for those of you who, don't, who are not sure, if Jesus were to come back today and you... You, you're not sure whether or not you go to heaven with him. You need to get saved right now. You need to make this confession. So let's make this confession. Let's talk to God together. Repeat after me. Let's make this confession. Repeat after me. Heavenly Father, I believe that Jesus Christ is your son. I believe he died on the cross for me. I believe you raised him from the dead. I believe he took away all my sins. I invite Jesus to be my Savior, my Lord, my God, and my King. And now I thank you for the gift of salvation. Amen. Praise God. If you prayed that prayer, you are saved. Now we want to encourage you to find you. Ask God to show you a Bible-believing, Bible-teaching church where you can go and receive the Word of God. And ask God to give you a teachable spirit. Ask God to send you where you can be taught and be willing to be taught. Praise God. And if uh, those of you who want to get in touch with me, you can give me a call, 404-201-1101. That's my cell, 404-201-1101. Or send me an email, Leroy Carter at yahoo.com. Leroy Carter at yahoo.com. Glad to talk with you. Glad to pray with you. Glad to share with you. Hallelujah. Now, we're going to end the recording, but we want to ask you to stay on and, and share uh, what God is doing with you. Share how this message has blessed you, and keep on trusting in the